There's a whole new world of technology known as fintech, financial technology, and we're delighted today that one of the speakers that was actually here two years ago is able to come back again. So I'd like to warmly welcome Gianni O'Connor, who's going to present to you, and also he's going to take over from the, um, uh, from the, the, uh, the emceeing of the whole event as well. So, Gianni, welcome. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, brilliant. Thanks for the intro. I was here last year on a very, very different account talking about a music app. Um, stupidly, what I didn't realize is sitting probably about there was our main competitor's head of product, and they nicked basically everything we had before I got home. Um, so long story short, no longer in the music industry. It's changing too much, and unlike a lot of industries that you see here, it's not, it doesn't accept tech as being the way forward. They're very, very different, very pushing back. So I said, well, you know what? The key thing is, is if I owned a lot more of the brands, I'd have a lot more control as to what they choose to do next. And that's kind of where this idea came about. Um, I was talking to one of the children last year, and he said, the problem you have is that the people that buy products don't own the companies. Um, and to be fair, to be brutally honest, I kind of laughed it off. But on the way back, you know, two-hour drive back to London, I really thought about what he said. And if you take that from a more financial point of view, he's saying that there's a real disalignment between a shareholder and a consumer and what their interests are in the brand. And if they had their choice, what they'd have the brand doing. So in terms of from a tech point of view, if, we, if the consumers of, let's say, a brand like Apple, the people who sit outside at 4 a.m. in the morning waiting to get the first Apple Watch, if they owned Apple, if they were the majority, what would their influence be on the company? What would the company be producing? Um, and that's kind of what I looked at with Stock Tickler. It was really about allowing anybody to own a share in a company that they, that they loved. Um, and this was kind of the quote, is that a kid said to me, why don't you just make things easier instead of making something new? Um, and what he meant by that was that a lot of tech, especially that I did previously, was about allowing you to do something that you couldn't currently do before. So a new way of doing this or something like that. But you can currently buy stocks online. So 1% of the population already do it. They do it every day, millions of times a day. But it's very, very complicated, and they're very high barriers to entry. So instead of trying to do something new, why don't I make it easier? Why don't I allow everybody to do something that typically 1% of people consider normal? So looking at that, there's a whole array of things that I'll go through as to why that's difficult. But the main thing is, is just it's overcomplicated. Um, there's really, really high fees for it, and you can't have a minimum amount. The minimums are very high. So if I want to buy a Facebook share, it's about £45 now. We could probably all afford to buy one. But if we tried to go to a bank to do it, they would say, OK, you've got to buy 1000 And it'd be a very high amount. And that's what kind of ruins it. But what if millions of us all bought one share? Then before you know it, the consumers would actually become the majority shareholders. And that's kind of what I'd love. I'd love to see something that looks like that. Um, Building this, we did some, some, uh, some sort of reviews and stuff with some bankers, and they said that one of the major shareholders in the UK, when Facebook went IPO, didn't actually use Facebook, and to this day now doesn't have a Facebook account. Um, but he controls a very, very large stake of it and has a very huge influence as to what the business does next. And that's what I think is dangerous, is that we can have great sessions like Digital 2015, where we all talk about the future, but if the business interest isn't aligned with the consumer interest, then we're always going to have this mismatch, and it's never really going to produce exactly what we're looking for. So to kind of give a timeline of the last year, Digital 2014 in June, um, I went to take the app, and we went to sell it, um, and with the sale got halted. Um, and actually, a really funny story, I'm going to the office of where uh, the financial firm were buying the, who were buying our app, and uh, you know when you go into an office building, they've got the, the list at the door of everybody in the building. And I go in, and it's just their name the first time I go, it's fine. And I go in next time, and uh, popular, there's a name underneath, I can't say the brand, it's a popular music social site, green logo, you all know it. Um, and they're literally right underneath. I think, oh, that's new. So I go upstairs now, and he says, oh, you'd never guess who's moved in downstairs, it's your competition. Oh, funny. Anyway, now, so September, we go back to him to actually sign off the terms. I go, I've got my special pen, the suit's all ready to go. Um, and they've launched all the features that we've done. So in sight, we actually tried to sell an app. And as we pitched all the great features that we had, they then ended up taking it from us directly. So that was a really unfortunate story, which led to October, which is just total manic depression, as you can see there, which is when you build something for two years and it gets completely taken from you. Um, and then December, a kind of idea came about, which is that I wish I could own brands that I loved. There's so many brands that I genuinely love. I just love the way they do certain things. Coca-Cola is one of my personal favorites. Um, and I've followed it, and I know the history of it, and it's just something I've really loved. And I, for me to actually invest in Coca-Cola for an average individual is really difficult. It's actually not very simple. It's not very streamlined. And 
sometimes there's a real difference as to is it deliberately like that so that only a certain kind of people can invest into a brand or is it like that just because no one's innovated in the space yet either way the answer didn't really make a difference and we moved forward so in january i discovered that the new york stock exchange and nasdaq being the two sort of major markets in the US all have an API. So for those who all know what API is, and it's simple, but essentially a feed, think of it like a radio feed for information where I can get a live price of any stock at any point in time. Um, in January, we pulled our first query, which was actually Coca-Cola, and it allowed us to take a live feed of any price at any time. So now we had the prices of the stock. We just had to find a way to take an actual stock from here, from buying a stock, to a consumer. Um, so I looked at a few things, but one of the things I looked at was ASOS. And just the time flow between actually seeing something on there and being able to purchase it is really simple. It's several clicks, and it's dead simple, and it's familiar. And I said, why can't we take stocks? Why can't I take any product and build it into a product that online fashion has got? You know, we'll all agree that online fashion has come so far in terms of making it dead simple to, for you to purchase anything in terms of advancements in delivery and so on. And that's kind of the way we looked at it. Um, and June being today, when we, we sort of launched the beta in, in a few countries and really tested it out, um, so for us, it was really about how do we do this? Because there's a real mismatch in e-commerce, as I recently learned, in I thought mobile was everything before. But what you find is with mobile is a lot of people view content on mobile, but they don't buy on mobile. A lot of buying is still done from desktop in terms of retail and fashion and that sort of thing. It could be through monitor sizes. It could be through convenience. It could be through connection quality. There's a few different arguments. But either way, we realized we needed a universal platform that would work on everything. Um, the chances would be that you'd actually buy it on desktop, you buy a stock on desktop, but you might check the prices during the day from your mobile. So that's kind of where the approach was there. So this is kind of what an early stage looked like, and we really wanted to mock it up like an online store. And it would just literally be an online store that just happened to sell stocks, but in any brand you wanted. So you could buy Apple, you could buy Facebook, you could buy Twitter, you could go into looking at bank notes, anything you wanted. But it was the layout and how easy it could be. So I wanted to be able to just simply click anything out of what my favorites were. And what this will do is pull up your local friends around you. You can connect it with your Facebook and kind of see what my friends are interested in buying. <laughs> yeah, so it was a, it's a really easy way. And we convert it into local currency because not everybody can calculate the dollar to the pound instantly in their head. And it's just about making things simple. So it took us six months to realize that actually, if we took it out of USD and put it into British pounds, that people would actually start buying it more. The fact that prices were in dollars isn't, isn't great for everybody. And it, I studied banking at university, so for a lot of what I was doing was kind of considered normal to me. I understood the market, understood everything about it. And there's a very big issue there with people building tech, not understanding that everybody else doesn't have that exact knowledge. And you really want to build something from the ground up that anybody can understand. So when we built this, we built this with 15 children. The whole, the whole site's built with 15 children. Um, and the aim of the game was that they could actually understand, number one, what we were building, but they could buy a stock in any brand that they knew without without any questions, just fully going through it and being able to buy. You know, one of the kids found Abercrombie and Fitch in there. Um, and another thing we learned was having, so if you look at something like Apple, you have AAPL being the stock ticker. But for a kid, that, that doesn't mean anything. AAPL doesn't actually mean anything. It's not the brand. So, so changing things to Apple and just making it easy for people. And that's kind of what this was about. So once we got that, we realized that people want to see a product page. People want to have some way that they can kind of find out the prices and just make it really, really simple. Um, and instead of saying buy stock, we literally change it to add to cart. And that one change up the sales by 2,000 in one day. And that was just simply making it more relatable to kind of an online shopping experience. Once you do that, you make it easy for people. And you really get people to a point where they understand that this is just any other product. The only difference with this is you can actually earn money off it. So then we did a, a, we'd actually did a trial. And we said, OK, we're going to do like a birthday gift. Um, and if you put in your, your date of birth, it will actually give you a stock on your birthday every year, 20% off. Um, and what happens then is that you actually buy someone, so last year someone bought me a Facebook stock for my birthday that's actually appreciates, and it's now I can send it as a gift card, and it's really just changing the way people view stocks, because the people that are buying it now are kids. They're actually anybody just buying someone a uh, Twitter stock or a Facebook stock. I think Twitter's like 15, 16 pounds at the moment. Um, and it's just really amazing, because when we built this, it was 12 pounds. So if you'd bought a couple of then, it's really just teaching, as I said, we work with children, but teaching them at a young point that actually this is something that goes up in value. It's not just something I use every day. It's not just an app. It's actually a real tangible company. Um, so this is exactly what it looks like. You, this is two Netflix stocks like that. Um, and you get a stock certificate sent directly to your house. It's all free shipping, so that's what that is. And our real aim was to kind of replicate a fashion-based e-commerce experience, because people are familiar with that. 
and we really wanted to just change the product but keep the process very familiar for you. Um, and that's kind of what it looked like there. So what it really comes down to is ownership. It's why do I want to own a company? What, what do I get from that? Um, and there's a couple of things. But the, the, the best thing for you, really, is that you want to own something that you, you build. A lot of the time, with, especially with IPOs, is that the tech people, if I say we in here, we all follow the brand when it's small, when it's a startup. We actually follow it up until the point it becomes IPO. And when it becomes IPO, the people investing in it have no idea why it got to that point. I mean, they can read the blurb that comes with it and the financial press that comes with it, but they don't know the actual buzz behind it, the actual excitement that got everybody to bring it to that point. Um, and that's what I want to change. I want the people that own the companies to actually care about them, to actually not see it as a number, to not see it as a statistic, actually see it as a brand that makes tangible products that we actually use, that actually change our lives every day. Um, and that's what ownership will give you. It will also allow you to earn or possibly lose, depending on the stock. Um, but if you look at some like brands like Netflix, if we'd have all invented, uh, you know, bought a share in Netflix when we um, when we've probably all got a membership, I calculated mine the other day. I'd have earned my well two-year membership back twice in six months. So that's what it's kind of about. Um, it's about really earning off the brands that you love, and as we build the brands, we want to be able to earn in line with that. Do it simply. So there's no commission, no fees available in any currency anywhere in the world, um, and 6,000 stocks currently available, which we're expanding. Um, so no fees forever is really important because the fees kind of put a price on. I, don't, I never believe in commission, essentially. I don't believe that we should actually charge you to buy into something you love. So there should be other ways that we can monetize that, and we do that through loyalty. So we can actually say to a brand, there's loyalty, you know, there's, okay, they shop with you all the time, but these fans are actually so loyal to your brand that they're prepared to buy stock in it. Um, and that information is very valuable to them, and that's kind of how we can benefit and give you guys a free service. So that's what it's more about for us. Um, so at the moment, we've launched it sort of in multiple locations. Um, we did all our trials sort of outside of the UK, which was really good for us because it allowed us to kind of learn a lot how foreign markets work. So one of the side benefits that we realized from this is that there's a lot of people in other parts of the world that can now buy into brands that they previously didn't have access to. So where we've seen our big drive has been sort of like South Africa um, and South America, where you're seeing people buy into the brands that they know and they have. They all have iPads, they all have iPods, but currently they didn't have any way to invest in Apple. So now you're seeing stocks actually being sold all around the world, and they're building brands, they're building a fan base. So you have a kid who, you know, I, I had a, a Skype conversation with a kid who didn't have any Apple products, but he owned two Apple shares. And I just thought that's really cool that you can actually, there's, there's not an Apple vendor near where he lives, but he can actually buy something online and earn out of it enough money so that he can actually now sell his shares and buy it and afford to pay for it to be shipped to directly where he is, which is quite remote. And it's just a really beautiful way to show loyalty to a brand that, there's a step past kind of reward card or points or discounts, but actually owning some of the brand. And we're taking it to the point with some brands where if you're a loyalty customer, they'll actually give you a share of the company now with us when you buy a large purchase. So provisionally, if you were with a certain technology brand and you spent several thousand pounds over a period of time, instead of just getting a thank you or some points, you'll actually get a share in the company. And I think that's where things should go. And that's kind of where we're, we're pushing it with, with several brands. Uh, next. So kind of the future for us is, again, loyalty, pushing that forward, but also looking at kind of what we're doing here. And it's, for me, it's, I mean, I, I love Stock Tickle and what we've been doing, but I've, I've really learned from before that it's not really about this product. It's not about Stock Tickle. I can tell you it's amazing to buy shares in, in a company. It's amazing to make it easy. But it's kind of when you're the first person to do something, you really change the ideology of everybody else. And it's the fact that every industry will all know there's a field, there's something in there that... People like to make things difficult so they can charge a commission for it. That's, that's the key thing. If it was easy, people wouldn't be able to earn commission out of it. You know, I took my car to a mechanic the other day and going in for a simple MOT and it comes out with a whole bunch of problems. And that's because I don't understand cars. But that's just how it happens. And this is really going to shake everything up to say that things have to be transparent. People aren't going to be just you know, prepared to pay because they personally don't understand something. If we can make something easy for everyone to use, if people can invest, if we can show that you can take something like the stock market and make it easy and make it commercial, then there'll be so many things that will open up. And that's kind of where the future for us really lies. And that's, that's kind of what's important to us. Um, lastly, touching on, on mobile. Mobile is a big thing for us. We're literally launching our mobile app in a couple of months' time. We're just waiting to kind of see how the website goes and really learn a lot because I've, 
I've uh, consulted for a few people and kind of said that you shouldn't build a mobile app before you really learn user behavior. So we've, we're building the website first. We really want to see what people use, what people like, what people don't like, and then build a mobile app because it's more compressed. So you don't really have a lot of space for a lot of features. So if you can kind of take off all the things that people don't use, really strip it down and build a great product, um, and that's what we'll do. So that's stockticklo.com. allows you to invest in any stock in the entire world easily in four clicks in any currency local to you. Um, that's my Twitter and that's my LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Anybody got any questions or my kind of any questions? Start from this side. Yourself? Um, what kind of regulations actually are <laughs> Yeah. Right, so from a platform point of view, that is a very good point. Our terms and conditions took us longer than to build the whole site in the first place. Um, and that's because of just the different positions that people come from. So you're exactly right. So in our terms and conditions, you have to agree to a certain number of things. The biggest issue we had was that you got people who worked for the firm that they were apparently buying for, which is your situation, which is totally illegal. Yeah. Um, so it would take me ages to explain to you, but our terms and conditions on the site will literally give you 10 easy points. I don't believe in big legal blurb, but it will tell you kind of one, two, three, four, what you can't and can do. So we kind of cleared it up that way. Um, but essentially working for the firm is a big problem. We tried all kinds of things. Um, so we've blocked the IP address from most major company headquarters. So i.e. you couldn't sit in sort of Apple, California and buy an Apple stock, that sort of thing. Um, but it, you really need to work outside of that. And it's a really difficult problem, so great question. Who was sort of next? Yourself? Yeah, so we always offer an automatic buyback. So one thing I learned with the market is instead of waiting for someone else to buy back, we'll, the company will always automatically buy back from you um, at the exact price, whatever the current market is. So it's all linked to API, NASDAQ. So whatever price you see on, you don't have to use our site, whatever site you use, if you use Google Finance, you use Bloomberg, whatever, it'll all be the same price um, within a two hour time span and we'll literally buy back from you. Also, another fact, you'll never ever lose over 80%. So let's say you did buy a share in the company, it totally crashed, we'll always pay you back at least 20%. That's regardless of the market. Yeah. Who's next? Yourself? Uh, sorry. Yeah, what about then the taxation and other th stuff? Yeah. Uh, so tax is all locally done, so in each local site, wherever you come from, it will tell you exactly how it is. Um, so if you earn over it, taxes payable in your local country, however your local regulations are, the problem was we couldn't standardize it because everybody's just tax difference is so different. Um, so we worked with a lot of countries that you have two options. You can either ban it and only use it within certain countries, but you can't really do the IP that way. So people always use Miro or Cloaking to use the site. So what we do now is we kind of display tax information on a general basis for like the EU, the US and China. Um, and then we have a, a, some other terms for your local currency, for your local tax rules. So we always say pay your own tax yourself, and, but from us we're just a retail site selling it. Um, so that's how it works at the moment. Sort of next, anybody else? How is stock tickler making money? How does Stocktickler make money? That is a great secret. Um, so, <laughs> a number of ways. Um, one is that we have something that I haven't really displayed here, but we are really trying to build a fan base at the moment, build a customer base. But once you do that, we'll actually be able to take, let's say, six months down the line, we've got 10, 15,000 regular buyers. You'll actually be able to take a company who aren't on the market and put them on a virtual IPO through us, and we'll actually be able to raise a lot of money for a company. So for example, you know, company A comes on Stock Tickler, they put their, uh, their stock price at 12 pounds, and they sell 100,000 stocks. They'll actually be able to raise a lot of money through that, and we take a fundraising percentage of that. So that's kind of our end goal, to be able to float companies without giving them the option of permanently being floated, because then essentially they could raise the money and then come back off the market, and we would always pay out our shareholders. So they can, that's kind of our, our, our way forward for us. Stock tickler, you can buy any share or not any share, sorry. NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, yeah. No commission fee? No commission fee. So, but if you want to buy uh, stocks now, you have to pay your broker uh, a bit of a fee. Yeah, exactly. So you're saying I can go through you and not pay anything? Nothing. Yeah. Yes. Why, why does anyone still use their stock brokers if they can go through stock tickler? Isn't there a limit? I just launched it 10 minutes ago, probably why. <laughs> I mean, I, I totally agree with you on everything. Um, Large, sorry. Like, so all the banks, mm -hmm. all the stockbrokers, <laughs> they all charge commission. Yeah. But you do for free. Yeah. You should have you should have done the talk, mate. That would have <laughs> summarised it in a second. Are you going to include budget stock? 
Sorry, buddy. I can include the LSE as well. I would love to. The problem is that their API isn't as good as Nasdaq's. <laughs> um, and it's really difficult, but I'm working on it now. It's our next project. So probably about four or four, four, five weeks. The problem is, is that they don't give us the feed in the same fashion. So where we have one section of the site, New York Stock Exchange and Nasdaq, personally, I believe that Nasdaq probably built the feed and leased it to New York Stock Exchange because it's exactly the same. Um, the London Stock Exchange is really, really different, and we'll actually end up taking a feed from maybe Yahoo Finance or, I don't know if you know, Google Finance just had an API, and they launched it, it literally closed it down two weeks before we launched, which is just really unfortunate. But we're working on it, essentially. So give us four weeks, and we should have it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Yes, DC. Do you think there's maybe too over, oversimplified? Do you think there's too much of a risk where people don't realize that they're actually, they actually see there's a the, the flip side waiting or see them off and not uh, invest in shares? Or there's also the flip side waiting on some food money. I think the fact that they're not doing that, I lose money in shares all the time. So no. Is there a risk of oversimplifying and the fact that perhaps people don't actually understand? Yeah. I definitely agree with you. That's actually one of my biggest issues with at the moment is that. We put it in a position where, from a, a building point of view, to sell it, you have this push where you know you love a brand and you should invest in it, and you're kind of assuming that you're buying something that's always going to build up. But you're right; it could slowly go down. Um, so two things we've done to kind of change that: essentially, we can't change the market, as you know. Um, what we can do is put 20% insurance in there. So we'll always insure 20% of your stock, regardless of the position of the company. Um, and then the other thing we can only do is education. And it's really, really difficult to put that in because you don't want to say, hey, well, you know, you can always lose all your money, otherwise nobody would ever buy from us and we really are trying to help people. But at the other end, you have, to put, you have to be able to sleep at night, essentially, saying that you have educated people because what I would hate is for someone to put everything into a brand that they loved based on our branding and what we've said. Um, and then anything happens to that brand, absolutely anything, especially it, it happened recently with if you put into a fuel company and they have an oil spill or anything, but you can't regulate how much. So what we also have done is limit how much an individual can buy um, without being an experienced investor. So that's, that's kind of the only reason things we can do. So if you're new to the market, we'll say, hey, you can only buy one share every certain you know, couple of weeks, couple of months. It's not great for our revenue, but it just allows us to know that you know what you're doing. Um, and that's kind of where we, where we stand with that. Conversation I can't really have, um, but yes is the brief answer. Uh, stock tickler on stock tickler. Sorry. Are you guys on stock tickler? Are we? Are you guys on stock tickler? No, we're not. No, just total coincidence. Yeah. All right. Are we? Uh, anybody else? Okay.